welcome, welcome, welcome to Health Issues. I'm your host, Chris Sylvain, and we are excited about today and what we're dealing with today in this day and time. Uh, but we have an, uh, a great show and a great guest. He's been on before, um, you know, a few years back, and we're excited to have him. He's from the Vera Institute. He's the director of the Vera Institute, in New Orleans, Mr. John Wool. Welcome, Mr. Wool. Thank you. It's so good to be back with you. Hey, no, uh, excited to have you and appreciate that, you know, and what prompted uh, that, we, you know, a great report that was published. Um, uh, if you could just give us a little background to it concerning incarceration in the city of New Orleans. Sure. Well, this is the uh, data center's first report in a series that okay. they're putting out to honor the 10th anniversary of Katrina. So they, they have maybe 12 reports, and they're going to um, issue them every week or two in the next uh, dozen or so weeks. Really? And so we're glad to have our report out there to, to kick that off. Mm -hmm. And the report was uh, written by Judge Calvin Johnson and my colleague Mathia Len and myself. And we were asked to write on criminal justice issues in the 10 years since the storm. Mm -hmm. And we decided that the it, it, one of the most important set of issues, if not the most important, is the, the progress and what's yet to, to, to be done in the issue of local incarceration, that is incarcerating New Orleanians in our local jail because it stands out in among criminal justice issues as one of the most uh, in need of change from the time of the storm forward, and one in which there's a lot of progress that's been made. Okay, and they can act, people can access that report at vera.org. Vera.org or the uh, data center research.org. That's data the data the, the the data center's website. Okay, good, 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 good. Yeah, good. and I invite people to to read the report. It's very interesting. I read the report. Good for you. You helped. That's I, right. <laughs> I, I wasn't going to come on your show unless you read every word of that report. And, re and I, re I really, I read the report. Your critical questions, That's your critical right. eye on that. That's right. No, it really, really did. And uh, 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 basically the report highlighted the positive things that have occurred uh, uh, from 2005 into 2015, mm -hmm. those 10 years. With an, uh, an attempt to give a brief uh, understanding of where we were before the storm and, and some of the reasons why and how it stood out. I mean, before, on the eve of the storm, we had 6,000 people in our local jail. And that's an ex extraordinary number. It's at least five times, five times the national average for uh, a city to incarcerate that many. And um, so it's, was clear to everyone, not only the size, but the conditions in the jail. And, you know, you'll recall with Katrina the images of prisoners on the Broad Street overpass and the uh, tragic events that happened where people were spread around the state. Nobody really knew where they were. Uh, so that focused a lot of attention on what we're doing in local incarceration. So that's where we started. Okay. Um, uh so some of the questions I had, you know, um, in a report, and I definitely, you know, I said what, what highlighted it was great writing. I think it was well, wonderfully written. The data center, like you mentioned, you know, uh, a powerful uh, group uh, that puts a lot together. Um, uh, it, it was staggering to see the 2005. There was an, a graphic for the people that um, had, like, there was a graphic that showed the amount of people uh, incarcerated in Orleans Parish mm -hmm. um, compared to the national average, and it showed New Orleans um, a big long bar, 12 feet long. Almost with off a, the page. Off the page. And the next closest city was Baltimore. Right. Less than half. Yeah, I think that's right. The national average was tiny, but those 12 cities with New Orleans so far off the page and uh, with Baltimore being less than half. Uh, but that's 2005. Okay. Right. Now, 2015, we didn't have a graph for that. We, we had some numbers, but we don't have a graph for that. And, and it's an, it would be impressive because we've shrunk that vast bar down to where we're, we're not the, uh, we don't incarcerate people at the rate, uh, the highest rate in the country anymore. That alone is a significant accomplishment. And I was looking for the data, though. I, that's what so, I well, was we, looking we, for to see where um, uh, we've gone. Did somebody right. else go? You know, there's a lot of things in there, you know, like what, uh, you know, kind of what, what, tell me what's Well, up. we didn't do the further analysis of other places, just to Orleans. But in Orleans, we've gone from, as I said, five times the national average to about twice the national average right now. So we, okay. 
not only are we down from the 6,000 level, but we're almost half of the post-Katrina high. So the highest number of people we held in the jail since Katrina was about 3,400. Right, right. And no, and not to be negative, that's not the point. We want to congratulate what's been done, and I think that's important. Um, uh, but, you know, questions still remain. Of course. Yeah, right. And so, uh, but we really don't know um, where we stand to any other city at this point, because they could have reduced too. And a number of cities have reduced, and this is part of a national story. Right, and it's, right, it's, right. it's why it's also good to see New Orleans as not trailing the pack. So um, a lot of cities over the past 10 years and even longer in some cases have been focusing on their local incarceration. So there's a conversation about prisons right, and right. prison incarceration. In the last few years, there's a lot more focus on jails. They've okay. sort of been lost in the narrative until recently. Okay, good, but New Orleans as incarceration capital of the, of the city, of the world, the country, well, this is if the country is gonna be of the world. We don't know yet if we're still the incarceration capital or not. I'm pretty sure we're not. I'm pretty sure, just looking at the numbers. Now, we, we have to go back and see Baltimore, Philadelphia, yeah, other places. Yeah, see if they're reduced and how much. they also reduced. I think they have some, but not to the point. Our reductions have been almost 50% since the post-Katrina high. Right, So right. we're now at under 1,800 exactly. uh, people in the jail. Which is true. So, we, But we we need to get those figures. That, I think that's that's important. Not everything that we so find out. So you more work for me. That's why I came on. Yeah, here. put you to work. Put right this back man to work. Just right. spent three months on this. Okay, but you're no, right. I'm just saying I'm, uh, to right. me because uh, you know the, that distinct that distinction. Um, uh, you know, and you know, you know, we focus on mass incarceration and that distinction of New Orleans being the highest incarcerator, and I had no idea it was that high. Right. Few people to be honest did. with you, I, I knew it was. I knew Louisiana's off the chart. That's right. And still. And yeah, still. still yeah, Louisiana hadn't moved a whole lot because actually I think it increased a little bit. It's uh, going up, up and down. Yeah, up and down, but it, it hadn't moved. So Louisiana's still number one. Um, uh, it was recent. In fact, I got it. I heard that the mayor, and, and let me not quote that, okay, but mentioned, this was in a report a couple of years ago, that New Orleans was the... Uh, had the highest incarceration. That's right. All right. The mayor now, is a couple of years on this issue. Yeah, I'm, they were exactly, which is which is key. That's important. Yes. But so I don't know if you know this report is more current of today. So we know as of a couple of years ago, New Orleans was the highest. And you know, for those that are saying that on present data, they can continue to say it. We just credibility. Okay, we will move on from there. Uh, okay, the next thing is some of the wise um, uh, pretrial services, and you know. Uh, a lot of issues associated with uh, um, the summons and, right. and, and, and those types of things have helped uh, reduce from 6,000 to uh, 3,000. Any other data I was looking for concerning uh, the level of pop who came back after Katrina? And I think that's my concern because it's the same question I have with the school systems. Mm -hmm. You know, who did come back, who came back, the level of poverty, the level of income, um, uh, as also, you know, who came back after Katrina and uh, any thoughts on that and how that may have played? Well, I don't want to go beyond what I know. So our, our look is strictly at the criminal justice system and the data there. But, you know, actually the data center's reports, as I mentioned, the, the Katrina at 10 reports, the index right. at 10, right. will have uh, discrete uh, essays on a number of topics related to demographics and economic right. okay, uh, so that'll become recovery and, and areas of economic trouble still. Okay. Uh, high okay. black unemployment remains an extraordinarily significant problem. Okay. And as we suggest in the essay, to some extent, the fact that we incarcerate so many black males, particularly young, young black males, and we have such extraordinary consequences to that. It's not just the days they spend in jail, but the economic consequences, right. long-term difficulties in getting a job, long-term difficulties in accessing housing, including public housing, right. makes it very difficult for uh, young black men to succeed in the city. And that is a problem that is very persistent. Well, you know, and, and, and that's one of the things I, I did get from the report, which you guys, what, what the report was on, you know, I think it hit the nail on the head. The statistics are undeniable, you know what I mean? And, and, and they're very, very solid. It's just, I, I guess there's so many other questions that looms 
and I give I go back at one uh, as you mentioned uh, and, and it, it spoke about the effect of young black males and the biases that right. affect incarceration <clears throat> and that was written I think it was a couple of times those biases were placed in there um, when we think about mass incarceration though we think about that uh, uh, that that is becomes the issue that uh, young African American males are incarcerated at a higher rate, um, where even though the crimes are the same, right? Same crime equal time, and I think uh, where it's, it's same crime but it's unequal time. So uh, on one corner we have the group that says, "Hey, it's a pity that black males are incarcerated at such a high rate." All right, and so what we need to do is have better schools, better jobs, better housing, so they don't commit so many crimes. Then on the other side, you have a group that's saying, uh, regardless of what you do with schools, jobs, and housing, uh, the, uh, many of those nonviolent crimes are the same that are in other neighborhoods, but uh, young African-American males, those biases are leading to their arrests um, at, a, at a higher rate. And you hear it in, see it in the newspaper in the comments where there's a constant, it's not a whole lot of struggle because basically the, the, the one group kind of takes over, but um, there are many that are saying that, um, that uh, better schools, better jobs, better housing, that's wonderful, but uh, the focus needs to be on the biases in the police department and criminal, other parts of the criminal justice system. Sure, Your thoughts? Uh -huh. <laughs> well, I think it's both. Right. There's no, there's, nobody says we have to choose one thing or another. Okay. Obviously, we need better education. We need yeah, better yeah, economic a opportunities a that's a um, for everyone, that's regardless. A that's a uh, and there's no doubt that, statistically speaking, black men particularly and black, black folks generally right. have much lower opportunities than others. Okay. And that's untenable. Okay. Right? Whether that leads to them becoming more involved in the criminal justice system or not, no one really knows this. But okay. we do know, statistically, they are. Okay. And that's got to stop, too. And whether it's bias in policing and prosecution and whatnot or economics, okay. right? So a lot of it is tied to economics. We have a, a, a criminal justice system that in many ways punishes people for being poor. And that, uh, to some extent, overlaps with race. So folks who are arrested for the same offense, this is the, the, the city's consultant um, found that the, if you're black, arrested for the same offense, you stay pre-trial twice as long in the jail before you get out than if you're not black, if you're white. That, is that race or is it economics, or both? We do see that the populations in the jail are 85% African American whereas the population of African Americans in the city, 60, 65%. There's no doubt that it disproportionately impacts in a negative way the black community. The data don't tell you if that's because of bias or some other factor. Uh, sometimes the police will say, well, it's largely African American communities that are demanding that we come and address crime in their communities, and then, therefore, we end up making more arrests and they're more likely to be black folks. Well, that's just, that may be true, but it's not a good answer, right? In the end, we need to have a way of providing public safety across the communities without overusing the most punitive, intrusive, and counterproductive means, which is using jail when it's not necessary. Well, if you're arrested for marijuana, mm -hmm. if you're arrested for a, a, a minor theft, not a robbery, but a theft of a store or something, mm -hmm. do we really think that keeping that person in jail for two, three, four months or longer is going to lead to a better outcome. Now there has to be accountability, but it's not always through the most powerful means of the government, which is to lock somebody up to take away their liberty, particularly before they're convicted of a crime. And sometimes the, the research is pretty clear that if you overpunish people, they're not particularly high risk, but you use the tool of incarceration too heavily, you're going to create more crime. In a historical context, though, okay, uh, looking at the history of policing in African American communities, mm -hmm. um, you know, the past 500 years or the past 30 years, the past 40 years, uh, New Orleans, particularly, um, in that context, uh, if we look at it, first of all, there, and secondly, 
if the problem is bias, then it leads to one solution. If the problem is not racial bias, then it's a whole nother solution. It's like a patient, you know, if, if, if they have diabetes, they need this drug, but that's all they have is a cold. Right. That drug. In other words, you know, you can give a sinus medicine to somebody with diabetes all day long. You know what I mean? And it just won't cure the issue. And so I think that um, if, if, if it's a bias issue, um, we can do unemployment education all day long. And we, 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 we don't, we, we won't touch the bias issue because the issue is, um, um, and, and we've been harping on it on a radio program, uh, 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 the, what's that, Buffett, Warren Buffett wrote an article that said that uh, it was about the minimum wage, and, uh, but his point was, um, education will not change the skill set of a large portion of the population because uh, it's in, it, the thing was, he used a, a basketball analogy. He said, he said training won't help him be a better basketball player. All right? So uh, that bias, I call it the, you know, the mayor speaks about the, uh, uh, the natural order of things, and he says that it's unnatural for uh, the black crime rate to be that way. And he specifically says he disagrees with that natural order philosophy, which is to his credit, obviously. Right. Um, but there are many who believe that it's just the natural order of things that black people will be late, lazy, and steal, and lie, and uh, be good at basketball, singing, and dancing. And they believe that that's the way it is, so therefore they will commit more crimes. And that, that, that philosophy, again, Warren Buffett put it in the Wall Street Journal, you know, we, we heard it from, um, you know, the Charleston guy, you know, with killing nine people. But that philosophy of uh, black people um, being just, you know, kind of innately different, maybe minor or whatever it is. But to, uh, 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 so if that philosophy is deeply embedded in our criminal justice system through the police, and it could be hey, black people can believe it. You know what I mean? Black police officers yeah, or black judges right. or whatever. Right. And, and so if that is the issue, that philosophy of, natu I call it natural orderalism, you know, the natural order, people thinking that's just the way it's supposed to be, that's, it is what it is, then uh, we have a whole different uh, uh, approach to if we're going to solve it. Right, so you're saying it's not then a criminal justice issue, it's a, it's a race issue, it's a sense of understanding that 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 narrative is fundamentally false. That it, there's no evidence that that's true, that that's just an expression of age-old biases, and that, that that is indeed, and we mentioned this in the essay, if we're going to make lasting, sustainable change in how we think about locking people up, right. one of the fundamental things we have to do is understand what public safety means, what it doesn't mean, and how we deploy government to police and provide public safety and how we deploy the criminal justice system. And it's got to be completely free of these misguided, tragically misguided biases, no doubt. But if the third richest man in the world can place it in the top business publication without any detraction, I mean, without any, any noise or, or whatever whatsoever, all right, um, uh, if, if throughout any place you have public comments, you know, newspapers, you find that philosophy mm -hmm. um, is not, and hey, it's not amongst the fringe. That this is a philosophy in this technological age now where um, uh, 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 those who have that philosophy, in one sense, they may arrest somebody where they wouldn't arrest the other one. But then on the other side, um, uh, a kid will be suspended where another one wouldn't be suspended. One kid would get an A, the other one would get a C. Those bias, if, that, if, if people have that philosophy, if they believe that, which is obviously pervasive, uh, if that's the cancer in our society, then all other cures, no matter how good they are, 
Or just addressing symptoms. Exactly. No, I, I think that is right. And I think, I mean, look, let's, we can't give up on this, but I do True. think some aspect of our attention to incarceration in New Orleans at least is due to the fact that there's a little bit of greater awareness. People are examining their own assumptions. The system actors are thinking about the consequences in a number of lenses. Obviously, the cost to the city of incarcerating so many people is a big factor in the mayor's office and others putting, putting real attention on this. But I don't think it's limited to that. We don't know, it's hard to measure, but the, the narrative is broader than that. It's about justice and sometimes expressly about racial justice. When we go and present to the city council, many of the questions are expressly about the disproportion of uh, the consequences of incarceration and other aspects of the criminal justice system on, on poor black people. Well, the Vera Institute itself, I mean, the, the, the idea of justice, um, uh, uh, historically though, justice has been denied to black people, okay? Yeah. The, the system, um, and, and so what, what, what many are saying though is that, uh, up until 68 and segregation, it was overt injustice, and it was coded into our, our laws and policies, That's right. okay? Um, and, 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 but the thing of it is, is the philosophy of it's just the natural order of things hadn't changed. The philosophies continued on. The actors continued to abide by their philosophy that black folk, you know, are still, they're lazy or whatever. Um, and so by going underground, when it only bubbles up in newspaper comments, it only bubbles up when a guy so rich as Warren Buffett could care less what anybody thinks. It only, it bubbles up now with the shooting of the nine people, mm -hmm. this philosophy that becomes the deep philosophy that they're different, you know, they're different. Um, by going underground, uh, many are arguing a point that we're in a worse situation now because it's a disease that isn't detected through normal means. Right. Well, I think it, me it means there's a greater responsibility to confront it directly because it's not going to be on the surface as readily. I do think there are other factors that just make it harder for the system to change. You know, the fact that we've built a system, an economic system. If you look at the criminal justice system, in many respects, it's an economic system, like a business. And for it to shrink, for it to, to not pull so many people in as essentially raw material for the system means revenues to, whether it's the, the sheriff or the judges, go down. And even if they wanted to do the right thing, even if they were disgusted by the uh, effects of the system on poor black people, they have economic self-interest to uh, stand in the way of, their, of change. And that's something we can address. It may not be the causal factor, but if you don't remove some of the other uh, disease factors in your analogy, then it's going to be hard to treat the cause. You know, you can't get people to move on something oftentimes when it's against their economic self-interest. Well, now, the, but that, that's where the argu other argument comes in, though. And, and, and the same thing, uh, by focusing on other things, you know, that, that isn't the elephant in the room, you know, we, we continue the, the detraction away from the real issue. It, it almost, it's like pacifying it. But it's part of the real issue, right? I mean, part of the, the history of black oppression has been black people are used for the economic interests of the ruling majority, right? Okay. And so in a, in, a, in a way, if you look at the economic interests, you're looking at the core, one core anyway, of our history of black oppression in the South, okay. right? Black people are the economic engine. They're the producers of uh, value for the, uh, the slave owner and, right. and now those who would benefit from their oppression in a uh, de facto way rather than a, a legal way. Right, right. I mean, right. this is the this is the theory behind uh, Elizabeth Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, mm -hmm. that we've really just 
shifted the uh, the model, but mm -hmm. it's essentially the same model. Right. And I think I think it's a route into the discussion. Mm -hmm. you, you may be right that it uh, by not confronting race directly, you're risking not getting to the core of it, but mm -hmm. it opens up a discussion to talk about how we're trying to fund the court system on conviction fees and bail bond fees, and who is it that uh, we're trying to get this money from? It's from 85 percent of the people are, are poor black folks, and that makes no sense, and it's, it should get people's attention because this sounds a whole lot like systems that we struggled for decades and centuries to overcome. Well, you know, I, I think, though, that, and, and I mean, I, I hear yourself, and, and I hear, you know, read some of the things and so forth, and the, the question from the black community, I use Martin Luther King's statement, he wrote, okay, you know the black folk stance. Okay, this is wrong, this is injustice, okay? Because obviously, you know, self-interest, we're the ones that's being ripped apart by the system. Um, but for yourself, okay, that you truly see the oppression, those that we know have this philosophy of it's just the natural order of things, okay? Uh, Martin Luther King said it, are people giving them just a free pass? You know, if we treat, if that, if, if ISIS came over and somebody said, hey, I'm a terrorist, I believe in you know, ISIS, I want to kill people, um, they would be labeled as such. But those who believe that black folk are just dumber and lazier, uh, it's almost as if they can, people can just say, I just disagree with them. And, but they still get to work and play and live a happy life and they're embedded silently and quietly because they'll never come out in the open, but they're still arresting people, they're still grading people tests, they're still uh, judging people in the courtrooms, they're yeah. still managing and they're still deciding budgets, they're still approving bank loans, they're still um, uh, deciding which businesses to participate in or just who to shop with. Right. So they're embedded in society, but quietly, we gotta go. I wasn't even able to ask the question. Let's keep fighting. We're going to have Mr. Wool back. Thank you so much. Do you guys.